Um, so, Rahul? Oh, yeah. And uh, would you like to tell your joke now? <laughs> <laughs> because Gitanjali has a joke. <laughs> so, a very uh, profound joke. A profound joke, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, am I audible at all? No, okay. I think I suspected that. This no, is no, better. Rahul, just orient yourself towards me. No, it's probably the mic. Yeah. This is a constant problem with me. Uh, but yeah, so I kind of find it useful to uh, think more in terms of creating an analogous text rather than a translation or, uh, or something that's, uh, uh, how do you say, an equivalent. We're not looking at equivalents here, we're looking at analogs. We're looking at how uh, if I was the same writer, but writing in a different language, I would have written it. In that sense, I think, uh, uh, is everyone familiar with uh, this uh, short story by Borges called uh, Pierre Menard, the author of the Don Quixote? Yeah. So for me, that's, that's the perfect translator. You're trying to immerse yourself into the person who is the, author, the original author. You're trying to think how they think, Kaur, know what they know. Can I stop you there for a moment and ask Gitanjali? Gitanjali, now you've heard him say, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not looking for an equivalence, I'm looking for an analog. I'm trying to create the analog text. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that as the translated? Well, actually I have, uh, oh dear, I have no real problem with that. Um, as a writer, I'm a very private person. I'm doing it very alone. And as soon as the book is out, and it's there for the readers, and it's there for the translators, it's going to open very different worlds for me, and I'm very open to that. So I really don't have a problem as, uh, I have certain anxieties, and those, uh, I mean, I'm not expecting, I don't even know what exactly is that I have written, so I can't even say that this is exactly how it should be. So I'm very happy to see what uh, kind of resonances and echoes and uh, another world it uh, gets transcreated into in the process of translation. And uh, I also, I, I've said this before, but you know, I think translation is uh, utterly wonderful because it's like communication. It's actually about communication and communication is at least in part, perhaps a major part, about miscommunication. And I think that's wonderful. So as long as beautiful things are happening, mm. as long as something inspiring is taking place. But if I may just mention very briefly, I think my anxieties uh, stem from something slightly more amorphous about, I feel, my writing. I mean, maybe other writers have um, other takes on this, but I feel my writing is a lot about cadence of language, and uh, it's a lot about, uh, the cadence is also a lot about silences things that are unsaid, and that together makes a certain, gives it a certain tonality, a certain experience. And I wonder what happens to that in the translation. I'm not always able to judge, but that anxiety stays with me. You must try and get that, you know, and it, just the word is not the text. It's the atmosphere sure. around it. Just the we're getting a lot of feedback on Gitanjali's mic. Is the sound, can the sound guy please do something about that? Thank you. I'm just going to take that beautiful notion that you threw into the pot right now, anxieties, and offer it to you, Karvish, for a response to. There are anxieties, I think, on both sides in a translation process. There's the anxiety of the, of the author who's, who's either being analogued mm -hmm. or transcreated, mm -hmm. or in the old-fashioned sense of the word, translated. Uh, and then there is the anxiety of the of the translator who knows that finally with a living author, you have to, and a living author who perhaps knows the language, mm -hmm. you know, you have to pass that test. I had to send my translation to Sachin, and Sachin had to say yes or no, yeah. you know, so anxieties. Um, yeah, I translate from Chinese. Uh, I've done three novels, and I, by two authors, I've worked closely with both of those authors, neither of whom reads English. Um, but one of my anxieties, going back to the topic of the panel on beauty and fidelity, is uh, not all literature
culture tries to be beautiful, or there are different standards of beauty. And some of the work that I work with, or that I translate, actually tries to be ugly. And so that puts me in an interesting position as a translator because I want to create something that's interesting, readable, and everything, but the, the, the original work is trying to jar, it's trying to offend. Um, and just to give a brief example, the first novel I translated, or co-translated, um, it's called Brothers, but it opens with an entire chapter-long discussion of a young boy in an outhouse peeking at women's butts. Um, and he uses a, a very vulgar term for butt, and it's, he uses it over and over again throughout the entire chapter. And he's like peeking at their butts, and then there's a, a memory of how his father was doing the same thing when he was young, and then his father fell into the, the cesspool, the, the shit at the bottom of the, the outhouse, and he drowns. And so it's a very graphic description, and it means to shock. It, but when we, gave, when we translated this and gave it to our editor, um, uh, she wrote, wrote us back and she's like, what can we do with this? This is, for her, even the very word but, which is in some ways in English, is, is softer than the original Chinese, she found it offensive. She's like, you know, I, can't, I can't get through this. And, and so that, and in some ways, the beauty of the original and of the translations is in it, its ugliness, right? Is in the, sure. the rawness. Sure. sure, of course. And I mean, you know, you think about uh, trying to get much of, of contemporary fiction across, which deals with dystopias, which deals with, you know, uh, people in frigid, loveless relationships, trying to negotiate spaces of warmth. The great silences inside an Indian family, which seem to be at the heart of Cobalt Blue, and it's rarely about beauty. You know, it's a, uh, the language may be beautiful and the effect may be beautiful, but another reason to dislike that title. Uh, Sachin, I was wondering, and I'd like to ask the two of you this, if you could respond quickly. Um, in some, you have, um, authors who did not, could not read the English. Right. Is that liberating or is that um, hindering? Does that make you feel, oh, if they could read English and understand it, then I'd be helped in the process? Um, I, I find it liberating, but I work closely with them. And in some cases, I've made slight changes to the text and I run it by them. Um, just very briefly, my father is also a writer um, in Spanish, and he's had a number of his novels translated, some of them into languages he does not know, uh, Bulgarian, Romanian, Russian, some of them into languages he knows very well, English and French. And he has made many enemies with his translators, the ones trying to translate into languages that he knows well. It's a, it's a deeply painful experience for him. Um, you know, if it's a language he doesn't know, then he's just like happy, he goes out there, he puts it on the shelf. If it's a language he knows well, it's an agonizing experience, and, and I sympathize with that. Yeah. Uh it's, it's both actually liberating and uh, kind of uh, confining to have to translate someone whom, who either does not read the language or is not around. Mm. Uh, I mean, there are, there are occasions when you need to ask them something. How, how is this working in, in the original? And yeah, you can't. And that's, that's the hard part. Uh, it's easy if they are there. and. Uh, Gitanjali and I had a lot, lot of back and forth going over uh, the roof beneath the feet. With with Magad, it was well, it was it was freeing because it allowed me to be a poet in some senses. I'd, I I used to write poetry once upon a time, and this kind of uh, got me another way back into writing poetry. And yeah, that that was liberating for me. Okay, Gitanjali, what about? Uh, would you um, like to respond to that? I don't know if I'm responding to that, but I've just you know, been thinking about language since you said that, you know, because it, I think, oops, echoing too much, language ki gunj. But I think, um, uh, again, it's, uh, it will go back to my whole thing of anxiety in translation um, or concern. I'm not terribly, terribly anxious about it, but there's a concern, you know, because when you're writing, you're also creating a language. And uh, I feel that very strongly about my generation, my time. So it's a very eclectic, very hybrid, very adventurous language that uh, a lot of us are uh, uh, creating. And what happens to that when it is you know, now going to be created in another language? And just to give a very, um, 
two examples come to mind. One child, remember I said uh, Shadeed Abhas, I don't know if you understand. Shadeed is intense and it's a word from Urdu and Abhas, I think the root of it is from Sanskrit and it's um, um, feeling, feeling, Abhas, Ehsas. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of people were disturbed by that. A lot of the gurus were disturbed by you can't put this Urdu word with this Sanskritized Mixed Hindu marriage. word. And uh, I thought to myself, I was much younger then, I had just started. And I thought to myself, I don't, uh, you know, it, my, my moment is different. And my language is not coming to me from the same, by the same uh, root. I'm just picking it up very differently. And I'm going to try Shadeed Abhas. If it works, it works. Otherwise, I learn as I go along. And I used a lot of language like that. Or another writer, Krishna Valde Zaid, a um, great Hindi writer. I remember he once used uh, the term langada bahana, which is lame excuse. Hmm. And I think he did it deliberately. Now, what, how do you translate either of these? You, know, you lose some of the echoes that go into it. You lose some of the deliberation that has gone into it, consciously or unconsciously. So what gets I don't think it's a, a story which has to be completely dismal, but there is something that has to be negotiated out there. Sure. Certainly. And Sachin, um, you know, I'm glad uh, Gitanjali brought that into play. A certain, there's in Cobalt Blue, just mm -hmm. as she was talking about being young and being ready to experiment and being ready to be free, you know, so Cobalt Blue is a very young person's novel because it's, it takes, according to me, great risks but it is also very close to the terribilitas of that moment mm -hmm. of first love yeah, and anguished break. disappointment. Yeah. So when you revisited this mm. many years mm. later, you know, when we were translating it together, right. and translation is a, is a cooperative act, you know, mm. I mean, even if I worked on my draft completely alone, Sachin is always standing behind me in a metaphoric manner and at some times he is, um, he is uh, laughingly encouraging me to play and at some times he's sort of saying, did you, are you getting it? So mm. did, what was it like to re-experience Sachin mm. Pundalkar so many years later? It's been uh, 10 years uh, Cobalt Blue was published in Marathi as Cobalt Blue as a title and uh, I had already floated away, I was not so possessive, I was not sensitive and touchy about the text, I'm attached to it. I own it and I cherish it. I, uh, but uh, you know how if the novel had been a year old or something, I would have been extremely pointed and sharp and I would have been with a <laughs> you know, microscope. I would have put the text under microscope. <coughs> also because it's an urban novel and the kind of society I live in, I uh, cherish certain amount of pollution. Uh, in my living, in my language, uh, the mixed identity I'm not Puritan. I, have, I can't be Puritan when I live in Bombay or Pune or in Paris or in Delhi, uh, big cities, because uh, uh, in, in, in one way or the other, it's not good to be pure. And uh, so tra when translation happens, you invite pollution uh, happily. And I was so keen to have that pollution, uh, those, those, the dust coming in uh, through Jerry's perspective, and I was very happy when I found it. Uh, I'm very touchy about the sound of words. I don't know if I'll be clear, too clear about it, but Jerry can help me. Uh, words like Safa, mm. uh, yeah. Ajji, Azoba, uh, yeah. grandparents. I, not for the sake of the meaning, but for the sake of the sound of those words. And I wanted similar sounds in English. Uh, I wanted that, I don't know, I, I wanted that audio feeling uh, to be left intact rather than the meaning part of it. And that came through beautifully in the first draft. And then I was sorted. As I said, I was not too attached to it. A decade is a good amount of time to be liberated from your creation. Uh, that was fine. The sounds were very interestingly uh, maneuvered, manipulated. And uh, it was beautifully polluted. Uh, Jerry, the way he is, is very, very sharp. You talk to him, and he gives you back in such way. It's a bullet that hits you. And it's there. It's there in the novel. So Jerry's persona is coming, which I'm very happy with. Because there's a human being, there's an intelligent novelist who's working on your creation. So he's going to bring in his own persona to it. 
his style. And I'm very open and I'm, I was very sorted when I read the first draft. I think we just had two meetings after that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Brief meeting, we just gossiped. <laughs> more, than, more than like, we pretended we were working, meeting in a cafe for work, very Parisian thing to me. Uh, but uh, yeah, we didn't work much. It's all genuine. <laughs> and so I'd like to bring this to you. You know, in some senses, both of us and uh, uh, Gitanjali and, and Rahul, share some context. Like with, uh, I was just telling Sachin outside that the new novel I'm doing is a Dalit, uh, uh, Dalit autobiography, the new book I'm doing is a Dalit autobiography written in 1971, low caste uh, person, lives in the village, comes to the city as well. But I share nothing with him, because not, even, not time, space, not life experience. With Tan Tanay and Anuja in Cobalt Blue, I know their worlds, they could be mine. Likewise, I'm sure there is some commonality between you are experiencing the Chinese landscape. How does that work? How does entering that space work? Um, well, there's not one China. There are many Chinas. And I know different aspects of China. One of the authors uh, who's, who I work with writes about remote villages in, from his home province in central China. And he writes about it in a way that he describes a life that is half imaginary, half real, but it's one that he expects his readers in China to be unfamiliar with, right? Um, and, and so he's writing from a position of familiarity, but with the expectation that even the readers in his native language, in Chinese, will find it alien. Um, and so I, I try to cap, I mean, I'm even more alien to that, even though I work closely with him. But so you try to bring the reader in, but preserve that, that sense of distance that's in the original work. Sure. And this distance, I think, is, is a question that keeps coming back. You've talked about immersion, right? And uh, Gitanjali's talked about concern. And concern implies distance in a certain way. So Sachin, uh, the, and you talked about distance too, because there's a time distance, time distance. between this thing. So that's, you know, let's just negotiate around this distance thing. Mm. Can we all just talk about what, what these distances are like in the experience? So Gitanjali, could you take off from that? In the experience of, okay, let's just take that moment when Rahul has emailed you his first draft and you are reading it. What is that moment of distance like there? Oh, I think uh, adjusting to the idea that in a sense, I'm no longer the author. I'm only partially the author, and somebody else now has uh, the central say and hold over it. I'm there as an advisor, and uh, I may fight about a few things if I want, but mostly it's now somebody else's. And if we can make a world that works, then uh, I just have to go along with it. So I think it's the it's the kind of uh, shifting of the equation. Mm. Um, that is one of the first things which happens. And uh, you mentioned, uh, the, again, I think it's, it's the old theme, but uh, lang uh, tonality. The sounds. And I, the sounds. And I remember one of our, not a full-fledged, it's facts, but we did have a little altercation about this because uh, I wanted some of those uh, sounds, some of them invented, some of them from the Hindi language, you know, run jun jun or rim jim jim or something. And he didn't, uh, he didn't really want to find an English equivalent and uh, didn't want to retain the Hindi. So we had this thing now, how you, you, know, you lose a certain informality if you just remove all that according to me, but he said he knew how to handle it better. So I don't know if we compromised or what we did, but we did find a way. And I think it is because, uh, because of a certain distance that one managed to uh, come to an agreement. And when I'm told by other people that the Rahul's translation reads very well, I think it's okay. I was not fighting beyond that point. Sure. And so, uh, Carlos, if I can take you to distance, there is a huge distance, one would imagine, between your life experiences and the, uh, the Chinese landscape and soundscape and, you know, ideascape. So how do you negotiate what is, which is the author that you're going to work with? How do you select what you'd like to do? 
How do I select my authors? Yes, or you, their works. If you're not, I don't suppose you work on someone's entire oeuvre, but mm. you select books. Um, it's, it's a little serendipitous. Some of the, the, all three novels I've done, the, the authors have come to me, um, and I've, and I've, but I accept them because they're works that I find inherently interesting. I'm also, I, I also do, do analysis. I also write about literature, and so I like to um, translate works that I, I'm writing about critically as well. And for me, I think it's, it's, there's nothing better in terms of just forcing you to, to, to do it carefully, to really engage with the text than to, to translate it, right? I mean, you know, it's one thing to read a novel, it's another thing to spend six months translating. You get to know the, the work so intimately. So if you're already thinking about wanting to, to work with the, 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 the novels in, 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 my, in my own work, I, I find this a, a, a useful um, yeah. exercise. You know, I was talking to a translator who, will, who should, I think, because I didn't ask her, should remain uh, anonymous in this discussion about a novel, a very famous Hindi novel, which also should remain anonymous. And when she finished her translation, apparently it ran into, it was too long according to the publisher. And the publisher asked her to cut a whole section of it. And she was, of course, terribly reluctant to do so because, of course, one has also invested in that kind of work. But the author said, it's fine, go ahead, <laughs> cut it. <laughs> Yeah, from the translation, oh. yeah. The author said it's fine. Very respected author also, so, you know, and she cut it. And then eventually she got slammed by all the critics for mauling the, the text. Which I think, uh, does that, has that ever happened, you know, with your, in your experience, the two of you? Well, not yet. I mean, I haven't had to cut anything so far. So Which is that, that's great news. What about the butts? <laughs> Did all the butts make it to the to the page? Our editor asked us to 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 mix it up. I mean, another issue with with the, the novels I've done mix is up. the issue of repetition. <laughs> that they, that in Chinese you can use the same word over and over and over again, whereas in English is not as permissive of that. And so we kind of we did butts, bottoms, rear. Da -da. Um, and I actually got a, um, a an email from a graduate student in, in China last week. Um, who's doing her MA thesis on the translation. And one of her questions was, why don't you just stick with one word? Why do you mix it up? You know, it, 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 why don't you just say, you know, ass, 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 ass. And I was like, well, um, my editor would not permit it. Um, but it, another, in terms of, uh, another sort of example along these lines is in, in that same novel, there's a recurrent um, uh, f first person plural uh, we Leo town, and then uh, we we that comes up over and over again. Our editor, when we submitted the manuscript, said this doesn't make sense because we don't know who this we is. There's no other first person, and so she demanded that we cut it. We had a long back and forth uh, where we were like, "No, this is a, a crucial part of the novel." She was like, "No, it makes no sense. You have to cut it." So we ended up cutting it. We told the author, um, and he was scandalized. Um, and so when the book came out in paperback uh, the next year. The editor let us put it back in, and then we added a, a, a new forward, a new preface, where we explained that whole process of deleting the, the royal we, uh, the author's response, and putting it in. And, and what's interesting about that is that it's, it, we also made a sort of a commentary on the translational process, right? Because the royal we, the translation is a collective endeavor, right? It's the author, it's the translator, it's the editor, it's the copy editor, um, and in some ways, Reinserting that we, that royal we, that we Leo town, is in some ways a reflection of the collaborative nature of the translation itself. Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can yeah. I say something? I mean, it just uh, sets off a memory in me uh, about my first book, Why, uh, you know, this we and I uh, issue. Now, uh, I'm from East QP, and we there is not always a royal we, it's also a humble we. And, uh, just me, hum, ye sochte hain, and it can mean ha, us. So in Hindi, that ambiguity worked very well. But when they had to do the, when, when the person who was doing the English translation, she had to make a choice every single time, whether to make it we or I. And I think uh, it, it was a choice which kind of pinned down the meaning. And there was something there, you know, which again had to be dealt with. And I remember in Tirohit, um, there's that uh, 
there's another section where uh, a nephew is remembering his aunt and he's standing at the window and he's the aunt who's now dead and he's standing at the window and he's looking out and he's um, recalling how she used to stand at this very window right. and look out and um, so she was full of desire she looked with curiosity at the people coming in and going out and so on and in the process of remembering her he almost merges with her identity so the last sentence in that chapter is main bahar dekhti hu aur cigarette phookta hu and i think rahul has to take a decision again on how to handle that so you know there are certain things which one language permitted which had to be done sure, in sure. another yeah. right. which i think gives uh, brings us to a very interesting notion of cultural reference and the cultural reference are not often about food or landscape as we imagine them but they are about actually the use of the tense yep. you know uh, in marathi for instance segueing from the past into the present and coming back into the past in one paragraph is completely allowable mm -hmm. and it may be allowable in a certain form of of writing in english but it is not allowable in the autobiography as a form because that's in english a lot more um, or the memoir which is considered much more um, important because it tells you one version of events it has more historic significance so i think these are the i uh, i think there's time now i think for us to ask if the audience has any questions um so uh, would you please uh, make the question specific to the person that you'd like to ask it to so that that person can answer uh asking the panel means that question takes over the entire space of five people responding that's not quite fair to the next question yeah any one of us will jump in Okay I just Sure thank you uh Sachin and I were sitting outside and we were talking about language in general and Sachin and I was saying telling Sachin that he probably speaks English much more fluently than I speak Marathi and he said but I'm translating all the time inside my head so if you imagine that there are three people here who are translators and two two people who are translated that's not true no. they're all translators all the, time. all the time you're a translator as well I mean tomorrow I'll, I I when you I leave you'll say thank you very much and I'll say uh rien and you'll translate that inside your head and you you're know you're translating the inarticulate into the articulate articulate constantly constantly you're translating like I mean you know you'll be sitting down to write a text message about this event to a friend and you are condensing abstracting cutting editing chopping fitting it in and sending it off writer editor copy editor all you no difference except just perhaps the autarky of the book mm. as a form and its fetishization in our literary landscape anyone else for a quick answer to that mm. okay next question over there there's yeah just next to you and then behind you hmm? my question is to gitanjali i just wanted to understand um what uh, after Where translation could you stand up please because yeah, you can't really no, see that's it that's okay yeah. i will place um, it translation uh does the basic story and the expression of the story gets diluted or it gets changed um i don't know what the basic story means uh, i because i really think there's nothing like a story without all the you know environment around it so and i really don't uh, care for the basic story it's not a it's not a term it's not a term i would think in something changes surely i can't put my finger on it but if it works something changes just the i mean if you say uh, if you use the word love and you use the word uh, endearing already you you know ev evocated to slightly different things but if the evocation is something rich and meaningful 
I'm at least quite happy with that. And I would just like it to be कुछ समृद्ध होना चाहिए कुछ बहुत ही स्पेयर बेयर उसको मेरे मेरे टेक्स्ट को रिड्यूस ना करे उसमें कुछ जोड़ता हो उसका एक माहौल क्रिएट करता हो तो मेरे लिए वो ठीक है ऑब्वियसली देर इज समथिंग आई डोंट वॉन्ट मिलीटेटेड अगेंस्ट बट दैट आई कॉन्ट पुट माई फिंगर ऑन जस्ट बिहाइंड Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the really very enlightening discussion. Um, now my question is addressed to Carlos. Um, translation today is a reality. Like there's no substitute for it. So um, isn't it futile to be bothered about the burden of pseudo distortion that it brings? To be bothered about the distortions that it brings. Is that what I got you to say? Yeah. Um. I don't think it's futile. Uh, I mean, it, there's a difference between translating and recreating. To go back to the first question and, and to respond to yours as well, one of the reasons why I translate is because I work on contemporary literature and I want to make it available to an English-speaking audience, right? Um, there's a lot of fantastic literature coming out of Greater China, and it deserves to be read. Um, and and. can't preserve absolute fidelity to the original but you the reader should be able to see what is happening in the original work through the translation and you try to and I try to be um sort of as you know adhere to that as much as I can but at the same time if 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 the if the, the reader cannot make it through a 400 page novel it's not going to do anyone any good so you need to create something that is is readable in the english um as a way of making it um available to the readership uh you know also i want to just point out that what may seem futile um in in the varying of it right is not actually futile in the doing of it so if you think about the editor who received marcel proust's first volume where there are 19 pages on the notion of how a certain phrase in music can produce a certain emotion you think say it in a line cut this 19 pages out but then you reduce swan's way tremendously so everything is a risk and often varying is also a risk it's a risk that you must take okay and i think that's what separates the people who care about from the people who don't care that we worry <laughs> say, sorry but we do <laughs> and i think translation is establishing dialogue which is absolutely important i mean you have to keep trying you fail succeed sure try to. an error but you have to keep doing gitanjali do you want to tell your joke your oh, profound yeah. joke that if i may <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah um it sounds frivolous but uh, i think it's not i think it's an excellent and very expressive example of how um translation uh, takes place across it has to slither across several um, cultural and linguistic registers and i'm telling you uh, an aap bhi thi it happened uh, i witnessed this i heard this but and i'm told other people have heard similar things with utter respect but uh, uh, like i said it sounds very funny but i think it says something else um, i was in a, a southern indian state and we were being driven around by somebody in to various locales and this person who was driving us around he met an old friend after quite a long time and he spoke to him in english perhaps the other person didn't know his mother tongue so he spoke to him in english uh, and it was uh, obviously a translation across several registers so he said hello how are you i hope and his friend replied somewhat i think <laughs> and i really think it i love fun. it's beautiful also <laughs> <laughs> actually it's a good it's, translation you know it's a zen koan <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing is zen <laughs> there were two monks in this guy that's right <laughs> uh there's a question over there yeah and here and at the back and then yeah. okay 
Um, this is to Carlos. Um, in the Indian context, I feel like, um, especially to the Indian reader, when something is translated from a vernacular to English, um, there oh, is <laughs> um, there is an ability to retain certain Indian features. For example, Gitanjali was talking about Indian sounds. They can uh, perhaps be retained in an English translation because perhaps to the Indian reader who's reading in English. In your situation, um, are there instances where you keep some of the Chinese or perhaps at the risk of an, of an American or an, an English speaking reader um, not understanding or, or do you just completely like, remove that entirely? Like, How does that process work when? Thank you. Carlos? So that's a great question. Um, I'm sorry, one more question. What no, no, is no. that? One book? question per person. There the, are three others. The no. book with the butts? What Excuse is that me, book? would you take the... Don't do that. Thank you. Um, no, that's a great question. And, and you know, if you, you cite Indian as an example, uh, but also if you're translating from Spanish, you can assume, or French, or even German, you can assume that an English language reader knows a lot of the, the terminology, and so you can throw in um, uh, Spanish words and expect them to, to, to be intelligible. Um, in Chinese, it's, it's, it's much more difficult. There are, there are a handful of terms that you can sort of assume that readers will have run across. Ni hao, everyone, you know, how are you? Um, and there are others that you can in, introduce through the text and expect the reader to figure them out as, as they go, go along. But, um, but it's, 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 you have to be very careful, right? Because you don't want a, a reader to simply open it up and, and um, to see a lot of words they don't recognize and to, to be completely alienated by that. Um, sure. Yeah. Over there, uh, in the, the cap. Yes, blue cap. Sorry, that's all I can see. Good morning. My question is to Sachin. I would like to ask, when you are translating, there's this author in you who would want the incident or the end to be in a very different way or a character to shape out differently. How do you dominate over the author in you and remain absolutely uh, fiddle to uh, the original author? As a translator, you mean? I think so. Just use film as a translator. Well, I... Uh, sorry, could you be more clear about this? See, I think sorry, Sachin I, doesn't translate. I don't translate, so... He's I, the all I've translated is front first of Truffaut's letters. Never published them. <laughs> <laughs> and Truffaut was not there. Uh, she also is an author, not a translator. But Jerry can. Rahul and... Uh, no, see, as an, uh, as an author, come translator, one of the things that you're doing, uh, as an author, you are God in your temple. Okay? You determine the universe. As a translator, you are the Bhakt in the temple of, the, uh, of Sachin Kundalkar. You come in and you look at, the, at what he has done and you offer your sense of, of connection to it as a translation. But when I'm writing, I'm with me, and I'm alone. And of course, as Philippe Guston says, you know, there are thousands of people in the room of the Creator, and then one by one they all leave, and finally you are left with the work, and then finally you must leave as well, and the work must stand on its own or fail on its own, and be, thank you, and be converted by everyone who opens it and make it into, who, everyone who opens that book makes it into a book event. These are important things to remember. But as translator, you come in second place. You cannot do anything that has not been done. You can hint, you can suggest that, you can open out a little, you can close down a little, you can iron out, you can roughen up, but you cannot. There is a moment when you say, oh, but she should say this as a response to that. It would be funnier, but that's not you, such a first. So all this about, you know, there is a, another writer and all, they're, very, they're being very noble. But actually, we in this universe work for and with them. They come first. That book comes first. That's all there is to it. Okay, there's no, there's no, you, otherwise just go write your own book. You know, simple. And say inspired by Cobalt Blue. 
then he'll see you and then all kinds of problems. Okay. Uh, no, there's one here in the front, red uh, dupatta. Do you think as a translator there is something sometimes to be said for a literal translation that leaves some of the words to the reader? Uh, Rahul, will you answer that since you've done poetry as well? Oh, well, what exactly is a literal translation? Uh, that would be my first question. Uh, do you mean uh, preserving the order of the words and the syntax of the original? Occasionally, I would say there is. I mean, it's uh, again, it's it's on a case by case basis. You have to uh, intuit your way uh, through the text mostly, and that's why I think it's very, very important for writers to be translators. You have to be a writer before anything else. You have to be able to uh, think in that manner and be a poet, be a writer yourself. Uh, that's how you can figure out what works in a certain context and doesn't. You know, uh, I once attended a workshop with A.K. Ramanujan, who is probably, um, you know, if there were gods of translation in India, A.K. Ramanujan would be one of the very large gods of, of translation. And he said, um, we were working, all of us had chosen one bhakti poem and were working on them. And so I was working on uh, a Mukta Bai poem, a magnificent, the T.S. Eliot of the bhakti space is Mukta Bai. Okay, she's not adorational, she is not uh, sub, uh, servile, she confronts her God with her, you know, with her intellect. Okay, so this poem is magnificently beautiful and almost resistant to translation. And he said, first step, just follow her in every single detail, every word, and leave the word order intact, okay, but hide that. That will be your skeleton. That will be your understanding of it. That will be only your draft. You will never show it to anybody else. After that, you must take it now and shape it again, retranslate it again into what Muktabai wanted to say. And if Muktabai were an English speaking poet, how she would have said it. So for me, that was, you know, I'm working on, on the Marathi Bhakti women saints. Again, I don't know their lives, I don't know, I'm, I'm not even a believer in that sense that they believe that even the name of Vithova will take you across the river, but I must find my way in and I must now grapple with a 17th century consciousness, a woman's consciousness of belief in another language for another God and I am loving every moment of it, but I would never ever inflict my literal translations on you because I respect you. Yeah? Over there. And how much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Hello. Good morning. My question is to the translators. Uh, I would like to ask you if uh, do you think that uh, the translator is actually visible in, in the translation. No, no, I think it would be really nice if you don't mind if we could ask them that. The translated that. Do sure, you think please. the translator is visible? Because we think we are invisible, no? That, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, <laughs> idea. But anyway, Gitanjali, will you start with that? Mm. Those silences Gitanjali uses are in <laughs> <laughs> Profound, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I should go hide somewhere. Uh, um, well, I suppose um, they are, but uh, I, I'm just sort of thinking along. I haven't um, worked this through in my head. I've not asked myself really that question, but uh, I think to the extent that uh, the author and the translator have found a, a rapport, a kind of uh, point of uh, a meeting ground, I think it does, it, it, it's a kind of third entity which gets created and it's not a, a bothersome, it's not one yeah, important. If that is not happening, then the problem has been solved. But they are, I think, visible and they are there, but completely 
uh, in, a, in a very out of focus way, you know what I mean, uh, not in a very, very sharp way, if you, uh, that, that they have to be there, because then there's no point in uh, the whole process, why would they choose to do it, that's my question, when, uh, and who am I to decide their presence, and uh, judge the amount of presence, uh, if they're going to spend uh, six months or a year of their time on the book that I've written, there's certain reason why they're doing it, there's certain cause, and that's just a commissioned book. But if they decide to do it on their own, then uh, it's, it's good only that they're with me. And I want that. I, uh, it's, it's, it's not generally word to word, right? It's also their perspective that's coming in. Uh, I, I'm getting this uh, feedback constantly on Cobalt Blue, especially on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, because what happened is Kobar Blue, uh, published in Marathi, was read by different set of audience. Uh, youngsters didn't read it. Now it's in English, Maharashtrian. Uh, young readers are reading it. Uh, slap them, but they're reading it now. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they send me a line that, oh, wonderful it was. Can't wait to read it in Marathi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, is it different? I, I tell them, but you've read it. Why do you want to read it? for what? And if you wanted to read it in Marathi, why didn't you read it in Marathi? So they, I think they they have this, uh, it's, it's from a reader's point of view, they always think and they always suspect a translator that there will be something else. There will be a person that says, I don't understand this question at all. Can't wait. <laughs> Okay, one minute. Uh, Rahul, you had something you wanted to say. Well, I, I was kind of going you to bring it back You said sort of that's the point about invisibility. Really. Yeah, I was circling back to the Zen angle and uh, since we were doing koans and stuff. Uh, it's kind of like, I'm, I, I like to think of it as an exercise in facing the ego. Uh, mm. You're there, but it's, it's uh, you're in the service of the text, not even the author, the text. And... Uh, what, what it gives me as, as a writer is, I mean, there are reasons why I'm doing it, obviously. It's not just because I like to be in the service of various texts. Uh, 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 what it gives me is a chance to introduce and sharpen uh, new tools for writing in English. Uh, that's, that's one of the big things that translations do, in my opinion, which is uh, introduce new ways of doing things into different languages. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Um, yeah. no, no, I, I just feel, you know, working with a translator is very similar to working with an actor. Uh, the way you direct actors on the sets. For example, you don't tell them exactly, this is how you should do it. This is what smiling is. When there's a scene written that he smiles when an actor is standing, I don't show him, this is how you smile. But there's a large bracket in which you allow them to play. If they cross that bracket, you come and tell them, no, we'll take one more take. And will you try once more? This is going out of the bracket. It's very similar. I feel they're performing there. With all their abilities, their thesaurus, their whole word bank that they have absorbed and grown into them, the language that they're working with, you should allow a fair amount of area for them to play. You can't be always pinpointed. And it, it's much like, I think, uh, working with actors in front of camera. No, I like the actor metaphor, and I was also just thinking um, like a musician, right? If you mm -hmm. go hear, say, Yo-Yo Ma performing Shostakovich, right? You're going to hear Shostakovich, but you're also going to hear Yo-Yo Ma. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think for, for a translator, you know, I, I don't think they should strive for invisibility. I think that you, know, you want to impart your distinctive voice while at the same time enhancing the original. There's a, um, a debate on a translator listserv that I'm on um, between well, a bunch of translators and uh, a, a, a journal editor who's been publishing uh, reviews of translated books w that often include no mention of the translator. And then the translators are up in arms, they're saying, you know, you have to acknowledge that this is a translator. You can't pretend that the book was written in English. And then the, the editor is responding, saying, well, we don't want to distract the readers. This is not a specialist publication. You know, the readers might get confused. But, but I think it's true. I think that uh, uh, I think reviews, uh, discussions should not should, uh, books in translation should, should acknowledge that you know 
that it's a collaborative process and, and speak to the translation as well as to the original. Okay, now I want to know how many of you actually respect the translators that you read. Put up your hands if you've read Asterix. Asterix and Obelix comics. Now tell me who the, put up your hand if you know the translator. Ha, bus. Go away. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you from Anthea Bell and Derek Hockridge who have translated those magnificent books. And thank you from all of us. Uh, one last question. Yes, over there in the front, grey uh, sweatshirt. There's someone in a corner here who's been trying to... Sachin, this question would be for you. Uh, as an author, uh, you, you haven't translated as such, but as an author and as a filmmaker, uh, you know, you have audiovisual texts. So when a work is being made into a film, hmm. so that is a translation in itself. Correct. So, and uh, if you see Shakespeare made by Bansali, or mm. it's a Marathi movie perhaps made from a book, Natrang or some uh, movie like that. So, how is the transition? Because then critics come very boldly ahead and say, Ki, Are yaar, books to alag tha. Asa na hota hai types. Mm. So, uh, well, I, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll only say from my own experience, I, I write my own scripts. And uh, shooting them is an act of rejecting your own scripts. Uh, the shooting, when you go on the floor, you reject the written text. Uh, film script is a very temporary document. I'm of an opinion that no novel should be made into a film because uh, nobody can and nobody should. Uh, I'll never do that. I've seen what happened to Madame Bavari in India. And uh, <laughs> we'll be watching uh, one after the other. And uh, 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 if, if a story comes to my mind, I'm very clear after a sort of meditating period that should I write a film script out of it or should I write a play uh, if it's just a story without any form. But I'll never, you know, kind of change the forms with my own texts and my own creations. So I don't think that would ever happen that's completely uh, out of context here, I feel. It's not translating the written thing into, it's actually rejecting the written thing. You are against the writer there when you go on the set. And I'm the writer and I'm a director, so I'm, I'm and that brings us to, with, uh, on a nice fighty note, we end <laughs> this conversation. Thank you very much. Go out and, and notice the translator. <laughs> <laughs>